Okay. Uh, this this talk is going to be uh, most of it is going to be in English, but then there's going to be a part in Spanish. Uh, so uh, you know, it's the, the two languages of the conference, and so it's okay. And uh, of course, now I am going to <coughs> present them both, our primary speakers. Um, I am really very honored and very happy to have you both here uh, for the part of, of this conference and given this, uh, what I know is going to be a very interesting talk. Uh, we have uh, Professor Manuel Casado Velarde, who is full professor of Spanish language at the University of Navarra in Spain. He has also been a correspondent member. I don't know if you say this in, in English. Miembro correspondiente. We, d we don't have academies, right? I don't know how to say this in English. We don't okay. have academies. Yeah, miembro correspondiente of, of the Spanish Royal Academy ever since uh, 2004. He is the principal investigator of the Gradun Research Project, uh, which explores interpretive and persuasive strategies funded by the Instituto Cultura y Sociedad and the University of Navarra. He has also taught at the University of Seville, uh, the Autonomous University of Barcelona, and the University of La Coruña. He is the author of approximately 200 scientific publications, among which we find the books Lengua e Ideología, uh, Tendencias en el Léxico Español Actual, de Colloquio, Lenguaje y Cultura, La Etnolingüística de Síntesis, El castellano actual, Usos y normas, EUNSA, Introducción a la gramática del texto del español, de arcolibros, lenguaje, valores y manipulación, eh, de EUNSA también, la innovación léxica en el español actual, etcétera, etcétera, etcétera. The last one from 2015. His main areas of research are the lexicon of contemporary Spanish, normative grammar and idiomatic correctness as well as argument, argumentation in the social media. He is a member of the scientific committees of many linguistic journals, among which are Rilse, Oralia, Esperia, Anuario de Estudios Filológicos, uh, Church, Communication and Culture, Boletín de la Real Academia Española. In addition, he was uh, one of the founders of the Spanish Society of Linguistics in 1979. And the Spanish Society of uh, linguistic historiography. He has also been the Dean of the Faculty of Communication and Vice Rector of the University of Navarra. So welcome uh, to this conference and uh, thank you for being here. Thank you so much. Ruth Breeze has a PhD in Applied Linguistics and has published widely in the area of discourse analysis applied to, the, to media language and specialized language. She <coughs> combines her activities as senior lecturer in English at the University of Navarra, Spain, with research as a member of the Gradun Research Group. So you both work together in the Instituto Cultura y Sociedad. Her most recent books are Corporate Discourse from Bloomsbury Academic and the edited volumes Interpersonality in Legal Genres, uh, Peter Lang, and Essential Competencies for English Medium University Teaching from Swimger. And she is currently uh, the uh, principal investigator of the project Imagining the People in the New Politics, funded by the Spanish Ministry of Economy and Competition, or competitiveness, I don't know how to say. Uh, as I'm sure you have been able to appreciate from this presentation, they are both distinguished members of the Spanish academic world, and we could not feel prouder of their presence here. The floor is yours, professors. <laughs> Thank you very much, Laura. Um, we especially would like to thank Laura for her excellent organization and for the invitation, and also Mercedes Diaz um, for inviting us here. And we'd like to thank the UNEF and all the other participating <laughs> organizations. Right? Seems an excellent idea. Um, this is our title. Yeah. Uh, as we know, for some, is it okay? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. For some time now, the central role of language in the study of the emotions has been a focus of interest, and the recent avalanche of linguistic studies on emotions represents an attempt to do justice to this complex area. The complexity of the phenomenon of the emotions itself, involving as it does a variety of processes, seems to be reflected in an even greater complexity as far as the linguistic manifestations of the emotions in different languages are concerned. So in this 
perhaps cross-linguistic studies may help us to define what is maybe universal, what is culture dependent in the areas of the emotions and provide increasingly detailed information about the particularities of each language in the way that emotions are expressed down to the level perhaps as we've seen today of, of concrete detail of grammatical like for example local grammars of different types of expression different emotions in different languages so the language itself then is a repository of knowledge and culture it is uh, in the words of another researcher, an interlocutor which may be able to give some of the most profound and unexpected answers to this almost impossible question. So, one of the most promising fields for the study of the emotions is without doubt that of phraseology. Idioms and fixed expressions contain a wealth of information about emotional meaning. However, we have to remember that much of this information concerns the colloquial levels of the language and therefore it is actually harder to research it. Okay, we don't always have access to this. So today we're just going to take basically four topics, um, which, which are all a little bit different. We're not actually going to talk about emotions as such, such as anger, but anger does come in to the things that we have to say, right? Um, so we're going to look at some issues to do with whether emotions are present or not, issues on silence and the inability to speak, um, how emotion is very often conveyed without using emotional vocabulary. So people don't say, I'm angry. They say something else. And the words they use are quite different. They belong to other areas of the language. And um, something which seems rather unique in Spanish, in my experience, this need to express very diffuse and vague emotions. Maybe... Uh, I don't like to enter into cultural stereotypes, but I don't know whether it's a need to express a feeling that, that so far hasn't quite formed itself, yeah. or whether it's euphemistic in the sense that you have the feeling, but you don't want to say what it is because other people might be offended or whatever. So we'll find out about these, right? This is, this is our topic today. Uh, and so we will try to keep to that order, and at the end I hope we will have time for some conclusions in Spanish. And for many questions in both languages. We also have examples from other languages. So my feeling is that if we show you the examples that we're talking about in Spanish and translate them, you will probably be able to see parallels in certainly in German, in French, in Portuguese, and so on, yeah, Russian maybe. Okay, so uh, just a brief introduction then. Although phraseology has been a focus of attention rec recently, it, we feel it hasn't yet reached its potential as far as the study of the emotions is concerned, it may seem obvious actually that a corpus would be the best starting point. But as we've seen maybe from Monica Bednarek's presentation, it's actually difficult to get a corpus that is very relevant, useful and so on for a type of language which is often very idiomatic and very spontaneous and so on. Um, scripted language is not the same as everyday spoken language, for example. Right? And another problem here is that not only would the corpus have to be extremely large, but it would have to contain a vast amount of colloquial spoken language in order to throw up enough examples of, collo of colloquial expressions of the kind we're looking for, since these are not statistically very frequent, and certainly not frequent in the kind of formal recorded context. Moreover, automatic searches are actually hindered by the fact that many of these expressions relating to emotions actually don't contain lexical items referring to the emotion, as I said, so how do you search for that if you don't have a word in it containing anger, sadness, whatever? And um, there are also problems in the area of actual searching because many of these searches require a lot of empty slots and therefore you're searching for something which may or sometimes has to have several <laughs> slots in it for the participants. Um, and therefore, you can't do standard corpus search searches so easily, right? Most of these expressions actually rely on metaphors and metonymies in different ways. And so looking for phraseology is actually more, more complicated than you might think. So our study actually takes a standard we reference work <laughs> as, its point for, as its point of departure, okay? Um, our study is based on expressions in the Diccionario Fraseológico Documentado del Español Actual, um, by Seco, Andres and Ramos, published in 2004, which has 16,000 entries. It's a, a dictionary of Spanish phraseology, so fixed expressions, multi-word combinations of a fixed kind, right? Um, 
several hundred of which make reference to the emotions in one way or another. In English, it's quite difficult to find a parallel reference work. We actually looked at several dictionaries of idioms, but idioms are, again, are rather different from fixed combinations. It's not quite the same. And we actually didn't always agree on what phraseology constituted in the two languages because of the different nature of the language. Right? Um, the, for example, the Longman Dictionary of English Idioms contains 4,500 entries and a lot of examples but it's not sufficient as a comparative point of reference. We ended up starting from Spanish and looking everything up in the Oxford English Dictionary in order to find valid examples and attestations and so on. So that was our standard comparative reference work. Okay. Um, so in this paper, we consider a range of the phraseological expressions in, in the Diccionario Phraseológico, classifying them according to various criteria and then seeking parallels in the English expressions that revolve around the same concepts. We hope this will bring out the special qualities of each language in this respect, provide many points for further research and show also a large number of similarities. So, as many authors have noted, for a cross-linguistic study of the emotions, it's not enough to look for names of emotions, that is anger, shame, joy. It's essential to go further because metaphorical expressions and metonymies constitute the usual way of talking about emotions and of actually conveying all the nuances and the drama of emotional experience. As Kovexis says, most of the expressions that speaker use to convey emotions are figurative and, in fact, it can be claimed that there is nothing in the conceptualization of emotions that is not figurative. Uh, Kovexis himself cites a study by another Hungarian, Giori, in which this author, sh this author shows, actually it's standard knowledge, how emotion words that we take to be literal, such as anger, grief, sadness, happiness, have a figurative origin. So, for example, the word anger in English seems to derive from this idea of painful, narrow, which is cognate with the German word eng. Yeah? Uh, so it's constriction, right? Uh, happy means fortunate, having good fortune in medieval English. Uh, sad is the nice one because if you are sad, we, we associate this with tristeza, right? Uh, sad is cognate with the German word zat. It means you've had your food, you are full of food, and you, it's after lunch, and <laughs> after lunch you feel heavy, low, sad right? <laughs> and this is where the idea of sad comes from so all emotional words are kind of figurative it's a way of expressing some kind of experience there are countless examples about this so before we start with this let's take an overview um, we're going to begin with perhaps the most basic thing is there an emotion there or not right so one, one way of starting uh, to, to look at this from outside is to say, is there an emotion or not? Um, the absence or presence of emotions in Spanish can be codified with this type of expression. So uh, they're quite interesting. According to the Diccionario, these expressions are typical ways of indicating an absence of feelings. Uh, so we have literally without entrails, right? Without inner organs, yeah? <laughs> made of cork, made of stone, and hard of heart, hard as a stone, not to have any inner inside organs, inners, innards, we say. Yeah? Um, this is quite funny. Uh, the opposite would be, obviously, to have a heart, or to have your heart, or to have your little heart. Right? <laughs> um, that's the person who does have feelings, yeah? um, which obviously build on these basic schemes so schemata like emotions are a living thing they're inside the body they're in the heart emotions can die <coughs> and so on i think i think we're all very familiar with these these ideas and they they realize them in different ways from the perspective of english they're quite funny because uh, in english as in spanish the emotions are located in the heart they are not located in your viscerae innards <laughs> insides they're not there right um, there is the English word guts, but guts is associated with courage, not with tender feelings. Yeah? It was one of the things I found always very puzzling about Spanish, that people have these things called entrañas. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay, right, but uh, what do you expect me to do about that? <laughs> Something not nice about that in English. Um, uh, notice there are also cultural things. So, for example, de corcho, yeah, of cork, has this um, 
because Manuel is from Extremadura, <laughs> he, he, he believes that the cork is to do with the dead, something dead. You take it off the outside of the cork tree. In my innocence, I was thinking of things you put in wine bottles. <laughs> but this is, <laughs> this is not to do with that, it seems. So, um, it's to do with the, the part that you pull off, which is like under the bark, isn't it? And that's what you use to make corks out of. And it's something dead. The tree doesn't need it. It's like, and it's also an outer shell, isn't it? Yeah. So, so this idea of something dead being Im without emotions is something dead. Uh, in English, we make a great emphasis on what seems to be the exterior of the person. So if you don't have feelings, it's almost as if there's something thick on your outside, like a suit of armor, which is protecting you from emotions. Yeah? Um, and protecting you from things that come from the outside, not from the inside. Right? So if you have a thick skin, you are immune to attacks from the outside. And so it's strange that in English we make a great emphasis when we're talking about the absence of emotion to this sort of protective core. I mean, not core, I mean exterior, which protects your core, right? Uh, we also have this idea of heart, okay? So a hard heart, a soft heart, and so on. Interestingly, in English, because of the greater grammatical possibilities, a lot of these ideas are frequently conveyed through compound adjectives. Um, it's just a possibility that language has. This is where we started to argue about whether this is phraseology or not, because technically we could say it's one word, hard-hearted. Uh, in Spanish, that option, as you know, exists, but it's very rare. So, boquiabierto, for example. But it's a rare phenomenon in Spanish. Um, so, English has a great insistence on the container. Yeah? It also has nice expressions like, it was like water off a duck's back. Yeah? In Spanish, you can say le resbala, yeah, but maybe it's slightly different. I'm not sure about that. Okay. Um, so English offers a different range of expressions for this type of emotionlessness and op emotivity in the form of different adjectives and different metaphors. In Spanish, uh, it's not so. Um, here, we also now move on to this idea that not only, well, are there occasions when you don't have an emotion, but very frequently there are occasions when you have an emotion, but it leaves you with the inability to speak. Uh, despite some recent interest in this area, we could say that the subject of silence has scarcely been tackled in linguistics. There is a silence about silence. Um, although recently there have been some publications and books on the area of how, how silence is represented. It is a universal topos, I think. Yeah? be careful saying things are universal. The people can't speak when they're affected by a strong emotion. Some emotions literally rob people of the power of speech. And this silence is an involuntary silence, different from the intentional silences that often occur when someone doesn't want to speak. Okay, it's different. Um, this gives rise to various phrases and expressions. These are found in current colloquial Spanish. We notice here perhaps what's interesting is the grammatical relationship between the subjects and the objects, because as with other psychological verbs, the person experiencing the emotion can have various syntactic roles. So in number one, the person experiencing this inability to speak is the object. Okay, something has left you with your mouth open. Okay, uh, in number two, the person is the subject. Yeah? The person remains without speaking. And in number three, the person is a kind of dative relationship to someone. Okay? So in English, actually, you can do all three as well. You can say the magician left the audience speechless, or his attitude left me speechless. Uh, the audience were dumbstruck, or whatever, or were at a loss for words. And number three, we can say, I don't know, the beauty of this picture brought a lump to their throat. Right? All three of those realizations actually translate into English in ex almost exact parallel. Uh, on the other hand, Spanish is particularly rich in a range of expressions used to suggest that someone is speechless. <laughs> I don't know if it's because people like speaking, but being speechless <laughs> seems to be uh, important. Right? Um, these ones we've already seen one, once or twice this morning, I think. Yeah. Uh, this is what happens to you if you can't speak. You remain bizco. Like cro cross-eyed, I suppose, yeah. Um, you have your ojos a cuadros. This is almost impossible for me to imagine. <laughs> but we imagine that you understand it, sort of. Yeah. Um, uh, 
the piedra is okay to, to be like petrified, literally like a stone, but it's because you you have a strong emotion. This one, que ha sido una pieza, it strikes me that in old-fashioned colloquial English, you can say, I was struck all of a heap. Yeah? <laughs> so it's almost the same as that. On the other hand, um, this one in English, uh, sin respiración, it was breathless, that's right, to take your breath away. But in English, it's not so much that you are uh, dumbfounded by something as that you're amazed by something. It's more admiration, I would say. And what we found very much is that very often parallel expressions exist, but their resonance and their prosody is rather different. So why that would be is, is a, a profoundly interesting question, but we don't pretend to answer it at this moment. Um, so, yeah, so, sorry. So, yeah, um, we could also mention here other expressions in Spanish, such as uh, tener en un grito, or dejar en un ay, which uh, are not strictly about silence, but they seem to indicate a loss of words. I was unable to find any parallels for these in English, but I don't know if it's just because screaming in English is not such a mm, such a, an easy thing to talk about, perhaps. I don't know if this is... Because it means to have someone in a scream. <laughs> what is that, right? I couldn't find English equivalents. Be very happy if you can give us some after the after the session. Yeah, it would obviously be a problem for translators. I think. Um, I think if we consider that in the predominant conception in Western culture, emotion is a force, something that is contrasted with rationality. There is a certain logic in these expressions. As Covexis says, um, in general, emotions are viewed as mentally incapacitating phenomena. The specific mental incapacities involve, in addition to these, things like inability to speak and inability to think. Okay, And we can take these to be special cases of the very general metonymy, according to which mental incapacities stand for emotion. Okay. Um, right, section four is about emotional meanings conveyed through expressions with no emotional lexis. We found that this is a vast topic and section of four is rather longer <laughs> than the others. And we actually think that this could probably give rise to any number of further developments. Yeah? As we've already mentioned, there is a very wide bibliography on specifically emotional or psychological lexis, particularly verbs or nouns, okay, Juana Marin, Alonso Ramos, and so on, on expressions, uh, it's also been shown using examples from many languages that somatic phraseology, the body, embodiedness, yeah, and verbs which indicate physical sensations are tinged with emotional meaning. Okay, uh, Since emotionals are so important in our lives and yet so intangible, many verbs with physical meaning have taken on by metaphor and metonymy a markedly emo emotional meaning. And this seems to be a natural linguistic process as these etymologies have shown us. So these are perhaps three rather typical examples. Pain is a very frequent parallel, okay? So doler. Um, so he is pained, if you like, or hurt by your words. It hurt me that you should say that. Um, she was dazzled <laughs> by the way you treated her and so on. Um, in English, it's pretty much the same, yeah? What you said really hurt him, hurt, wound, touch, uh, boil, freeze, chill, and so on, hit, all of these things are used in rather similar ways in English and Spanish, although there is ample scope there for a, a contrastive study, I would say. We're not going to go into so much uh, detail here. Uh, it's quite usual to do this. As we know, emotions lead to some somatic effects. In Spanish, it's said that the eyes are the mirror of the soul, right? This somatic manifestation is reflected in a lot of physical metaphors. If we just think of one word, think of one word in Spanish, which is cara, face, we can look at enormous lists. These are just a few of the ones that would come up in any dictionary of phraseology. Um, it seems that people have very expressive faces. How you can look like bread without salt <laughs> I find these, could someone draw that for me, please, or can you do one? Yeah? Um, a friend of a few friend, a, a face of few friends, <laughs> <Yeah>? <laughs> a face of dog. 
<laughs> I think these are culturally embedded, aren't they? And to actually understand really what they mean, you need quite a lot of experience. <laughs> this, for those of you who teach Spanish as a foreign language, would provide a very interesting activity for your students, I think. <laughs> um, Cara de Vinagre is a nice one, a vinegar face. You know, in the the festival of San Fermin, because we are based in Pamplona, you have these sort of monsters, kind of people with big heads, you know? We call them kilikis, they are thing. And one of them is called Cara Vinagre, and he frightens the children, right? He goes around frightening them with the thing that he hits them on the head. Well, yeah. Okay, and in English, actually, this is interesting, because in English... Um, we do say, we have some expressions like a straight face, he couldn't keep a straight face, or uh, we have seen a lot of sour faces there, right? A poker face seems fairly universal uh, because of poker players, right? But uh, it's interesting that there isn't exactly the same semantic field because cheek, for example, uh, cheek in English is one bit of the face, right? And someone who is cheeky, uh, in Spanish is descarado, right? In Spanish, this is face. Right, so face, chita, yeah. face, yeah. caradura, yeah. a hard face, is cheeky, whereas in English this is reduced to cheek, although you can say bare-faced cheek, so you can emphasize it by talking about the whole face, uh, or he's a bare-faced liar, right, so bare-faced in English, which is strange because faces are always bare, well, you, unless you wear a burka, right. Um, Faces are usually bad. <laughs> why, why that would be is rather a complex issue. Okay? Um, there are also emotion expressions of this kind which don't contain emotional lexis, which are conveyed through other metaphors, some of which are more cultural. So, for example, if someone is experiencing a strong emotion, such as grief, and doesn't show anything on the outside, we can say, in Spanish, the procession is going through the inside which makes me think always of when it rains and there is a procession and the procession has to go through the inside of the church or the monastery because you can't get wet, right? Um, and there are some parallels for that in Catalan, in Basque, but in other cultures where processions are not really so much part of the culture, <laughs> it has to be expressed in a different way. So it's highly culturalized as well. Um, so you might want to say, uh, whatever, great griefs are mute, exists in English, but is not very current. I, it doesn't seem familiar to me. Whereas the procession is going through the inside is a very expressive idea. If you think of all the noise, color, activity, ex or, or solemnity associated with a procession, that somehow it's going inside, right? It's not externalized. Other interesting kind of cultural comparisons, for example, the whole thing about technology, right? Uh, the person who experiences the emotion is like a machine which something is overheating in it or is, is getting a bit <laughs> going too fast. Right? Um, th these ones seem to refer to a, a technological world. On the other hand, in English, I think English is more creative in this. To me, English is it shows sort of the roots of the Industrial Revolution, that you have an awful lot of metaphors to do with going off the rails and letting off steam and blowing fuses and gaskets. And this one is from aeroplanes, to go into a flat spin. I would like to reassure you that aeroplanes don't do that anymore, right? This is kind of the primitive form of aviation around the time of the First World War with little biplanes, and they were going to a sort of <laughs> a spin, and then they couldn't get out. And strangely enough, even though that phenomenon doesn't exist anymore, uh, people do still use this expression. I've heard people use it, right? Uh, the Spanish one, for example, partir por el eje. Eje is the axle yeah, of a vehicle. So a cart, for example, a horse and cart or a, a stagecoach would have a, an axle that's very important. Yeah? And so if someone experiences this, it means they're broken, right? They're broken. They can't, they can't function. So perhaps this alludes not so much to a world of high speed and vehicles as to a more rural type of, of society where a cart has one axle, perhaps. Yeah. Um, obviously, an even more productive source of emotions is this one, which is to do with direction and container. We've all talked about this a million times, I'm sure. Um, notice that these don't, don't, don't actually contain obviously emotional or somatic language even though you might see bits of it there, I would say. So to go up the walls, 
yeah, is to do with you're so angry that you're, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you're sort of going up like this. Um, you're you're throwing what is it? It's like kind of uh, foam. You're foaming at the mouth. Yeah, it's again the container is in this case you, and it, the emotion is too much for you. Your teeth are coming out, right? You're so angry that your teeth are falling out. We can't say that in English. Um, and to go up the vines, the vines are on the outside of the house, we suppose. So instead of going up the wall, which is the inside, you're going up the vines on the outside. Um, these are all combinations of this sort of emotion is going up, emotion is contained within a container and can burst out. Um, the English expressions in this context are rather interesting, actually, because they've gone through a process of intensification. So in English, the earliest ones, if you look at Oxford, it says that the earliest one is to go up the walls. But the problem is that this wasn't enough. So we got even more angry and we went through the roof. So first of all, we went up the walls and some years later we hit the roof. And then some years later, people went through the roof. Yeah, and it is actually in that order. If you look at the first attestations in the Oxford Dictionary. I have a feeling it's to do with this highly expressive and rather emotive uh, American English that was very dynamic in the 20s and 30s. It became a kind of the leading force. In, in English. Um, so these ones, I also like in English to be hopping mad, you know, you <laughs> that, one's, that one's quite funny. Um, uh, what, what is also interesting is the number of variations of this kind of idea. Estar fuera de sí means to be outside yourself. We say in English to be beside yourself, right? And in Spanish you have a lot of these things which in indicate that something is not in its proper place, it's not functioning properly, but this is not to do with like a motor vehicle or an engine or, or people moving, it's something different from that. Um, especially sacar de sus casillas, su quicio, I always found as a non-native speaker of Spanish, I was never sure what people's casillas were. <laughs> why, why should anybody have casillas? <laughs> they're little, they're the squares on a, on a chessboard, for example. Yeah? Um, it's been interpreted, interpreted to me, at least in the dictionaries, as being these squares on a gaming board or a chess board that, that if you're out of your squares, you're out of place, you're out of order, you're not quite functioning properly. Um, so it has the underlying metaphor of the games board, the chess board, or, or being where you're supposed to be. Um, but it all comes back to this thing of being outside yourself. So um, be outside yourself is to be out of your mind, to be out of control. Sometimes I'm by si beside myself, which isn't necessarily bad. <laughs> well, it's a silly joke. When one is beside oneself, there's always someone to talk to. <laughs> it's this idea of a split personality, or a, a, a person who is not in control is a, a broken person in some way, right? Um, in German, you, you also have this, yeah? Völlig aus dem Häuschen. Um, to be out of your little house, right? Where is your little house? The Germans will... <laughs> where is your Häuschen? It's, it's out of your mind, really, isn't it? It's, a, it's a, out of your little house, right? Um, at bottom, they make reference to this idea of being in the wrong place, of an emotional force or impulse pushing you into the wrong place. Um, but it is interesting that the connotations are somehow different in these different words, so different expressions. So. In English, for example, being beside yourself is different from being out of your mind. They have a different resonance. If you're out of your mind, you pr often you're a bit crazy, right? Whereas if you're beside yourself, it's with rage or with excitement. The limited number of emotions can be associated with that. Uh, aus dem Häuschen, I've understood as being a kind of either anger or uh, sort of ecstasy, completely, wow. You know? um, in English, you have an expression, out of his box. But that's associated, in the dictionaries at least, with drugs. Okay, so if you're out of your box, it means you're high on dope. There's no way you can talk to him. Okay, so in each language, these things take, take on very specific meanings. And they're not, although they seem to be the same, they're not, right? Um, here in Spanish as well, you have things like sacar de quicio, which means to be unhinged. That is, you're off your hinges, like a door which is off its hinge and doesn't open properly. Um, sacar de madre refer refers to rivers, right? So a river which follows its proper course. If you live in Spain, you know about this, because Spanish rivers are much more exciting 
than English rivers, for example. And sometimes they're not there at all, and sometimes they suddenly come and carry everyone away. It's the nature of weather. It's more dramatic, right? Um, so if a river is outside its kind of proper course, it's dangerous, it's damaging, things can happen. It's wrong, it's bad, right? And so all of these things refer in some way to something that is divided outside where it should be, outside itself. In some of these are very interesting. I, we don't have time to talk about them in detail, but it seems to me that the simple source target relationship of metaphors is actually a bit inadequate. People are not like doors, right? People are not rivers, people are not doors. Maybe this concept of the blend, so Mark Turner and Fauconnier, this idea of how prominent counterparts from the input spaces project to single elements in the blend, blended spaces. So you're looking at an abstract quality of doors and an abstract quality of people and somehow linking them up. Actually helps to explain it a bit more. Again, these things have to be explored in more detail. And we don't have time to do that, right? Um, so just down to two very typical things, right? Two very typical things. We're going to talk about animals and heat very briefly because they're also very common examples in which non-emotional words are used to convey emotion. Um, person experiencing the emotion is or contains an animal. Está como una fiera. He's like a wild animal or he's, he's turned into a basilisk. This is an animal we don't have in English, really, but basilisks seem to be more common in Spain. Yeah. Um, in English, you, you can visualize the person as a kind of animal which is tied up. He's at the end of his tether. Okay. Uh, <laughs> to go hog wild, to go ape, are American in origin. To me, as a person from Yorkshire, to get someone's goat is far more <laughs> part of my register. It, it suggests you have this goat inside you, you know, and every now and again it gets out <laughs> and sort of, <laughs> it's rather like a, and hits people, you know, it butts them. Um, it, it's this idea of a red rag to a bull kind of, yeah, something someone says just gets you, you know? Okay. Yes, it's very much the same metaphor. Obviously that's not a, 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 an expression, it's, a, it's one word, but it's the same idea, absolutely the same idea. And I think in a rural society like Yorkshire, <laughs> for example, um, this idea of the goats is still a bit more active, right? Um, then there's this idea which is a development of that. As I say, it doesn't work very well with source target because the relationships are all different, right? So sometimes the emotion is the moving animal. Um, so control over motion is control over emotion, right? So this idea of amansal trote, hold your horses, steady on. These are things you say to animals, steady on, right? You don't say that to a person, but you say it if somebody's sort of getting out of control, right? As if that person were a horse, okay? <laughs> <laughs> um, and this idea also that our emotions are in themselves unpleasant animals. Yeah. <laughs> if you have to control, if you have to uh, get a control over and do something you don't want to do, yeah, something that you don't like, and you have to do it, and you have to control your emotions. You can say that you have to swallow frogs and snakes, or follow, uh, swallow a frog, <laughs> which. In English, I think we don't have, right? We don't swallow frogs, but it's still a, a very interesting graphic <laughs> metaphor. Regarding the second one, those are animals, right? The second one is heat, and this is very familiar to all of us. Again, Spanish is extremely creative in this. Uh, this idea of fires, throwing out sparks, uh, lightning, steam, all this sort of thing. Uh, in English, it's obviously parallel. And I think the creativity of this in Spanish is interesting. A lot of these expressions are very common, right? Seems to be anger is pretty, <laughs> pretty often expressed, right? In English, it's interesting because heat is negative, but cold is not always positive, right? So to keep one's cool is good, but to be cool as a, cu a cucumber is not really good. It implies that that person is being very cheeky or very uh, antisocial in some way. Um, and to be a cold fish is definitely bad, okay? So that's again back to where we started with lack of emotion, okay? So, <laughs> something like that, <laughs> okay, <laughs> right. And then finally, the last thing we're going to talk about, as we mentioned, is 
emotion expressions with a, which have a diffuse semantic profile. What do we mean by that? Um, you can say in Spanish, Elena me dio no sé qué, pero le he perdido. Helen gave me something, but I've lost it. She, maybe she gave you a handkerchief, she gave you a pen drive, she gave you, I don't know, a sweet. That's a thing, right? I don't know what is the thing. But you can say also in Spanish, me dio no sé qué, que decírselo. It gave me, I don't know what, to say that to her. <laughs> in this case, it's not a handkerchief or a pen drive or a sweet, right? We don't know what it is. You can only translate it into English by saying, it made me feel a bit funny. Gave me a funny feeling. Yeah? You can't say, it gave me I don't know what. <laughs> well, you can, actually. You can, right? And if you've lived here a long time, you probably do. But it's not actually something that native speakers can understand, right? And we, we wondered about this because it's an imprecision, or is it a euphemism? perhaps, which enables the speaker to say that he or she felt a bit funny about something, but either was unable to define the emotion, or was unwilling to define the emotion, or felt it was not socially appropriate to do that. It seems to have been created on the basis of give, right? So in Spanish you can say, me dio miedo, you know, it made me feel frightened, you say, it gave me fear. What I love is, me dio pereza, it made me lazy. <laughs> <laughs> I really like that. It's kind of, I know exactly what it means. Um, <laughs> sometimes, you know, as we said earlier about like Schadenfreude, until you've met the word, you don't know there's a word, but you know what it is, right? Um, and so, me da vergüenza, it gives me shame, it makes me feel ashamed, okay? And so, me da no sé qué, is it gives me a mixture of shame, fear, anger, whatever it might be, laziness, who knows? Um, the verb give is delexicalized, it's a causative, and it forms a complex predicate in which the dative is interpreted as the experience of the emotion. Um, but this emotion, in the case of dar no sé qué, has a diffuse semantic profile. So either you get it from the context, or maybe you're not meant to get it at all. Um, this expression doesn't admit agentive subjects, but prefers subjects that have to be reconstructed from the context. You can't say, really, what it was that did it. It has to be reconstructed. Um, so in English, you have to translate it with other ideas, yeah? Like feeling funny. Nobody knows what feeling funny is like in English either. It's certainly not funny ha-ha, but it's funny... Mm, strange, right? Uh, the equivalent to this is uh, another one which we found, which is medio cosa. Medio cosa. <laughs> yeah? What is that? What is cosa? Yeah? It gave me thing to say that. <laughs> so, um, in, in Spanish, you can say it gave me revulsion, uh, regret, pain, shame, fear, whatever. Okay, that's explicit. But yeah, but in Spanish, you can say medio cosa, and we don't know what the cosa is. What thing? What thing is it? Right? Um, cosa in Spanish is not as universal as in Italian, where, where cosa is in Italian something you just say if to ask questions, right? Uh, so it's not delexicalized completely. It's something that has to be reconstructed from the context, I think. And it may be euphemistic that this is where you would go to a corpus and try to find out what reasons underlay this use. And so there are also other expressions in Spanish, which we won't go into. Um, which means something like to cause unease, misgivings, whatever, uh, which have a complex history yeah, and a culturally related one. So the general impression we get from all of this is that for a phrase or an idiom to convey emotion, there's absolutely no need for it to contain vocabulary that makes reference to the world of the emotions, nor is there any need for it to include references to the body, even though it may have somatic undertones, right? In fact, a particular word can come to be understood as something psychological through a web of associations that may be very difficult to disentangle. This is a channel, a challenge for linguists like us who are interested in the emotions. And it must be a very great challenge for the people who work with things like big data who are supposed to be retrieving the emotions from all the varied and totally colloquial things that people are saying, for example, on the internet. Uh, so it will be very exciting to find out how that works. And now Manuel is going to conclude. Oh, <coughs> yeah. Thank you very much.
como muchos investigadores han puesto de relieve, se habrá podido apreciar a lo largo de esta exposición el estudio lingüístico de la fraseología emocional tiene un gran interés. Primero, por la enorme variedad y riqueza expresivas que presenta en las lenguas en las que se ha explorado. Segundo, por lo que revela acerca de la particular conceptualización de las emociones en las lenguas. Tercero, por lo que su estudio comparado ilustra con respecto a las peculiaridades de cada lengua. Ana Birsvika ha demostrado en diversos trabajos que los estudios sobre las emociones se basan demasiadas veces en conceptos a priorísticos obtenidos de una sola lengua, con mucha frecuencia el inglés. Pues bien, el estudio comparado resulta muy ilustrativo, tanto en su vertiente meramente descriptiva como en su orientación aplicada para la traducción, enseñanza, resolución de conflictos, etc. La omisión de la fraseología en los estudios sobre la conceptualización de las emociones constituye una carencia muy importante. Afortunadamente hay una tesis doctoral en marcha muy prometedora de la que se ha presentado un anticipo provisional esta mañana que promete un gran avance en este sentido. Pues bien, la omisión de la fraseología eh, afecta al alcance de estas investigaciones y de sus resultados. Una investigación que solo tenga en cuenta, por ejemplo, los sustantivos o los verbos o los adjetivos, pero no las unidades fraseológicas con que una lengua cuenta para nombrar o expresar las emociones, nace con unas limitaciones muy notables. En la presente ponencia hemos partido de algunos grupos de unidades fraseológicas de contenido emocional, tal como aparecen codificadas y definidas en el diccionario fraseológico documentado del español actual que se ha citado, obra de referencia indiscutida en el ámbito hispánico, aunque con el límite de abarcar solo el español europeo. Posteriormente, hemos procedido a establecer la comparación acerca del grado de equivalencia o correspondencia en inglés. Eh, se comprueba a lo largo de la exploración llevada a cabo que también en lo relativo a, las, a los fraseologismos emocionales se puede, se puede afirmar con covexes que no hay nada en la conceptualización de las emociones que no sea figurado. A la vista de la extensión oceánica de la fraseología emocional, hemos seleccionado para nuestro estudio varios campos, concretamente aquellos que conceptualizan áreas en las que se suele prestar menar a las que se suele prestar menor atención y pasan con frecuencia inadvertidas en las investigaciones, como son la falta de emociones o la simulación de esa falta y su contraste con la presencia de ellas en la fraseología, la incapacidad de hablar provocada por la emoción, la expresión e interpretación emocionales de fraseologismos carentes de léxico emocional, aspecto al que hemos dedicado particular atención. Como resultado de la comparación llevada a cabo hay que destacar los múltiples paralelismos observados en las dos lenguas, español e inglés, que hemos ido señalando, entre otros paralelismos, que no repetiré ahora, la falta de emociones se plasma en la fraseología del corazón, en concreto su ausencia, así como en la comparación con objetos físicamente duros para la falta de emoción y blandos para la presencia de emoción. Hay algunas expresiones en los dos idiomas que reflejan el esquema «la emoción es un animal cautivo» que sugieren que la persona que experimenta una emoción fuerte se convierte en un animal, aunque vemos que no es tan sencillo y merece la pena volver a analizar toda la complejidad que presenta. Asimismo, se comprueba paralelismo en el esquema conceptual de la temperatura, la emoción es fuego, calor, en el que el impulso emocional se relaciona con el aumento de la temperatura, común a ambos idiomas. Y también hemos ido señalando las diferencias de ambos idiomas, como entre otras, que el español destaca en su conceptualización de entrañas como sede de las emociones positivas, el amor, el cariño, etc., aspecto que falta totalmente de la fraseología correspondiente en inglés, que el inglés frecuentemente refleja 
las mismas metáforas en forma de adjetivos compuestos, hard-hearted, soft-hearted, thick-skinned, etc. Estructura muy inusual en castellano que ofrece como alternativa construcciones fraseológicas. Que la fraseología del español proporciona abundantes expresiones en que la fuerza de la emoción resulta incapacitante. Por lo que respecta a la lectura emocional de locuciones carentes de léxico emocional que tienen el esquema conceptual algo o alguien que se sale de donde debe estar, contenedor u otro lugar, contrasta la abundancia de expresiones fraseológicas en español frente al inglés. Por último, las referencias a dar no sé qué y dar cosa con el significado de emoción negativa de perfil semántico difuso. Queremos destacar en particular la presencia y la relevancia de expresiones fraseológicas emocionales carentes no solo de léxico emocional, sino incluso de léxico somático y hasta del léxico en cuanto tal. Sirva de ejemplo el superarchilexema cosa o la, la palabra baúl cosa. Todo ello conduce inevitablemente a ampliar de forma considerable el campo en el que hasta ahora se vienen desarrollando las investigaciones acerca de la conceptualización y expresión de las emociones. No nos cabe duda de que la ampliación que postulamos reportará múltiples y relevantes hallazgos. Como resulta claro a la vista del programa de este congreso, uno de los motivos por los que el análisis de las emociones interesa a lingüistas, pedagogos, retóricos, psicólogos y otros profesionales reside en el hecho de que las emociones sean a la vez subjetivas, en el sentido de propiedades del individuo difícilmente transferibles y solo parcialmente definibles, y objetivas, en el sentido de acuñadas con términos convencionales y sujetas a tipologías establecidas. A los lingüistas nos interesa en especial el hecho de que cada lengua y la cultura correspondiente acuña palabras y fraseologismos para emociones que difícilmente se pueden expresar fuera de ella. Ignacio Bosque se refería a la dificultad que tenía una hispanohablante que vive en Nueva York para traducir al inglés, sin perder matices, la palabra española cariño. Los mejores diccionarios nos dicen que cariño es love, affection, fondness, tenderness, equivalentes que dejan insatisfecho a cualquier hispanohablante nativo. En sentido contrario, un amigo norteamericano anglohablante con muy buen conocimiento del español decía hace unos años que cuando se sentía disappointed no estaba exactamente decepcionado, ni desilusionado, ni defraudado, sino más bien una mezcla de todo ello que no era capaz de expresar en español sin perder algún matiz. Y es que quien quiera manifestar una emoción propia en otra lengua no quedará satisfecho cuando se le ofrece un sentimiento aproximado como equivalente. Desde diversas instancias, termino, se viene echando en falta la existencia de un diccionario onomasiológico de emociones en diferentes lenguas. No es tarea fácil, por lo que hemos ido apuntando a lo largo de esta exposición y por la escasez de estudios parciales. Si alguien quiere saber qué significado emocional tiene la expresión española subirse a la parra, puede acudir al diccionario académico o al diccionario fraseológico de Seco y otros, ambos diccionarios semasiológicos, que bajo la palabra parra le solucionará el problema, significa encolerizarse, una de las acepciones. Pero si un estudiante de español como lengua extranjera quiere saber qué locución podría usar en español coloquial para expresar esa emoción, encolerizarse, los citados diccionarios no le serán de utilidad alguna. En cambio, el diccionario de uso del español de María Moliner, por poner un ejemplo, le puede prestar una valiosa ayuda inicial, concretamente en el lexema, en el lema encolerizar, y en su apartado catálogo ofrece múltiples, aunque muy heterogéneas, posibilidades de encontrar el fraseologismo coloquial sinónimo o cuasi sinónimo, además de diferentes colocaciones. Ahí figuran, por ejemplo, pues salirse de sus casillas, estar como un basilisco, echar chiribitas, echar chispas, montar en cólera, ponerse hecho un energúmeno, perder los estribos, echar venablos, además de subirse por las paredes. Pero no es un diccionario concebido para estudiantes de L. La idea de un diccionario onomasiológico de emociones 
tal como lo ha esbozado Ignacio Bosque en un texto inédito del año 2016, para los modismos en general, orientado a L, es una empresa que vale la pena acometer contando claro estar con un Claro, está con un buen equipo investigador y años por delante. Si, como afirma Borges, refrendando una vieja idea, las palabras son recuerdos de experiencias y al mismo tiempo símbolos que postulan una memoria compartida, los diccionarios deberían aspirar a reflejar esa memoria con la mayor precisión posible. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Thank you very much for this interesting talk. It was really interesting to see the comparison. I had never thought of some of, of the examples that you've given that they're really, yeah. So, uh, of course, we have some time for questions. Do we have? Yes, yeah, few, two or three minutes. Thank, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I'm also interested in comparing uh, emotion expressions um, personally between American English and Korean. And uh, when, 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 I was uh, when I was collecting word, uh, expressions, like emo emotional expressions, I, um, I was hesitant. I was, I was not sure if I should include some slangs or new occurring words. Yeah. Or the words that are uh, often used in int internet, that uh, as, as you uh, mentioned, but uh, but I was hesitant because I, I was not sure if yeah. I should include it. Yeah, um, our, our philosophy for this paper was to, to include only words that are in major dictionaries, right? Uh, the problem of including slang is there is no real reference work. Not really. I mean, there are some reference works, but not so reliable. And because we found it very difficult to find a corpus, right? Then, then I mean, we know we all know the slang, but it's it's difficult to say whether that's going to last one year, five years. We were looking at things that are really part of the language. I, I think in Spanish, particularly, there is a, a strong concept that some things are part of the language and some things are a, a passing phenomenon, right? Um, in English, we tend to have a more kind of open and receptive idea of everything is part of the language and everything is not, right? So, um, but I think your problem will be first methodological. Yeah, where do you find the slang? Where can you get written examples or or corpus examples? Yeah. So we were, it's not that we have anything against slang, but we just found it easier to start with things that are really established and well known things that are in major dictionaries. That was why we did it like that. It is a problem. Yeah? Any other questions? Yeah, we have no more time. So if you want to ask more questions, maybe there for lunch. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much.